Welcome to the History of Networking podcast, where the giants of networking explain how we got the networking protocols we have today. Today, Russ White, Don Sharp, and I are joined by Daniel Walton, who's going to talk about BGP AdPath in turn. Uh, Daniel, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Daniel Walton. Uh, I am a principal engineer at Cumulus Networks. Uh, what can I tell you? I've been a BGP guy for a long time, but get to work on a lot of other stuff. So uh, kind of jump around all over the place at Cumulus, but I still work on BGP. So uh, still in the routing world, I guess. Very good. And uh, you have some history with the IETF and churn and BGP. Uh, Why don't we start there? Start there. Okay. Um, So, yeah, so I've done uh, a couple of drafts and a couple of RFCs at this point. Uh, but one of the first ones I ever did was uh, about BGP med churn. So I'll just sort of dive right in. Uh, so med churn we found uh, in like early 2000. Uh, so at the time I was working at Cisco and I was on this team called the ISP expert team, which uh, in a nutshell is basically what they call advanced services today at Cisco. But it was a pretty small team and we only dealt with ISP customers. And uh, one day we got uh, a call or email or something from UUNet, and they were one of our one of our customers that we supported. And they had this weird problem where they had they, like thirty thousand rounds exist? turned. <laughs> they don't they exist? exist anymore, right? I don't know UUNet's what happened. UUNet's gone, right? I think yeah. they're gone now. This is the history of networking show, so we can talk about how that's true. Have all disappeared. <laughs> so we can talk about UUNet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, at, at the time, they were like, you know, the the big ISP, right? Yeah, they were. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, we supported them and Sprintlink and uh, Global Crossings and a whole, whole bunch of pretty big ISPs. Um, but anyway, so you know, they, they reach out. They're like, oh, we've got this weird thing. We've got like 30,000 routes that are basically churning like they're just constantly you know reconverging and reconverging and just never ending uh so i got on and you know started looking at it and at first i thought i was like oh this is probably some weird confederations bug because unit ran confederations and they were like that was kind of the the exception you know uh most most big isps were just using route reflectors so at first i looked at this and i was like all right this is some confederations thing um, but, uh, I, I like picked one of the prefixes and just started troubleshooting it. And what I saw was like every 60 seconds, this prefix would go through this little dance where like it would send a bunch of updates back and forth between like four or five different routers. Uh, and then it would settle down and it would be like dancing right on. back in the same state that it was in three seconds ago, like before it started dancing. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then you wait 60 for seconds. Ronda dance. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no dancing no here. <laughs> you bought is still dance. a network engineer. I, I know I don't necessarily fit the profile always, but no dancing. No dancing. Um, but anyway, so it, it would do this, do its little update dance. And, you know, at the end, it was basically right back in the same state that it, it had been, uh, you know, two seconds earlier or whatever before it sent all these updates. Um, so I looked at this and then uh, I remembered, so one, one cool advantage of being on this ISP team was uh, we had access to like, lots of different ISPs because you just walk to the cube next door and say, hey, can you, you know, log me into Sprintlink? Uh, so they logged me into Sprintlink and I start poking around and they had the exact same problem, um, but they didn't use confederation. So at that point I was like, okay, this, so this, this isn't a confederations, uh, you know, issue, this is something else. Um, Global Crossings was my customer, so I, I logged into Global Crossings. They had the issue. Basically, like every ISP that we looked at, you know, in the U.S. that we had access to, had this issue on some scale or another. Now, you know, it was so, probably so, the worst. But. So, Daniel, one one thing is, a lot of people listening to this because this is again the history of networking. Confederations really are historical at this point. I don't know anybody. I can't think of a single provider 
or a single network in which confederations are deployed. So some of our listeners are watchers. Yvonne called this a podcast, but, you know, I actually see her face, so I'm a little bit confused by the whole. But anyway, um, some of our watchers may not actually know what a confederation is, right? I mean, maybe I'm like, but it seems to me like a lot of people may not know what a confederation is. So maybe it's worth spending a second just talking about what a confederation is and why you might have thought that a confederation bug was the genesis of the problem that you were seeing at that time. Uh, okay, good good point. Um, so confederation, so let's say you, you've got your your BGP AS and you've got, you know, 100 BGP speakers in it. Uh, and BGP has this rule that all of your IBGP speakers have to be in a full mesh. Um, so that's kind of pretty much a pain to maintain after, you know, a handful of routers. So the way most folks solve that problem is they deploy route reflectors, right? So you, that's, that's your standard way of avoiding the full mesh. Uh, but the other option is confederations. And confederations, you basically take your autonomous system and you break it down into little sub-autonomous systems. Um, and then within those sub-autonomous systems, those, those guys or girls have to be in a full mesh, but it's only within the little sub-ASs. And then you basically peer between each sub-AS. So it kind of looks like eBGP, but it's, but it's not. It's, it's internal. Um, so, so, right. So the basic problem you're addressing with a confed or a route reflector is that BGP really guarantees loop greenness through the AS path. And within an AS, you don't have an AS path. So you've got to figure out some way of guaranteeing loop freeness within IBGP. So the original way to do it was you just ran full mesh IBGP. Well, that's really not scalable when you get to 20 or 30 IBGP speakers. So what you do instead is, is, you know, in a confed, what you're doing is you're actually creating an AS path and you're just stripping the AS path off at the edge. So you're using that internal AS path as your way of guaranteeing loop freeness. In a route reflector, you have this silly thing called a cluster ID, which is effectively just Everybody freaks out when I say this. It's effectively just a mini AS path. Yeah. That's all it is. From 10,000 so, feet, a, a cluster list looks like an AS path, right? Yeah, it does. Right. And it, it solves the same problem. It just solves loop freeness. So sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you, but that was that might be important for people who don't understand yeah. what why confeds might have to do with this. It, it's I, I'm with you there. Like I, I can't remember the last time I saw somebody use confederations. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty rare. Um, yeah. Someone told me that it's more popular in Europe. Like there's not uh, some. Yeah, but they use Europe, OSPF but... too. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, even even back then. I mean, even in 2000, it was unusual. Like UNET definitely stood out as being different for using confederations. Um, but they but they did but they used them uh, and like. Where was I? So we were talking about logging into different ISPs. So basically, yeah, okay, every, everybody had this problem, um, and but but nobody knew it. That that was I, that was really so why, weird at the time. So why didn't anyone notice this? Um, so my kind of theory was that there, there was so much churn that happened in the internet routing table anyway. I guess I guess they were kind of used to it. Um, Unit. So I, I remember. I mean, they had like thirty thousand routes churning from from this med churn thing. So I mean, it was it was significant, and we tried to figure out like when it started, and I mean, they they had no clue. So I mean, my guess is it had probably been doing it for a very long time, like months or years, um, and they had just I don't know, never noticed. Well, the internet really never converges anyway, right? So. It's just a matter of how many routes are yep. churning. And so yeah. maybe 30,000 is not a big deal to them. But I mean, at that time, the routing table was going back to 2000, was maybe 150, 250,000 routes or something like that. So 30,000 is still a pretty big yeah. percentage. You would think that somebody would have gone, hey. It's a big chunk. Know, wow. Yeah. Yeah, there's always some background noise just of random random stuff converging all the time. So yeah, it never, never really yeah. stops. Um, but... And honestly, it would be interesting. I, I don't remember the engineer's name at UUNet. Like, I, I kind of wonder, like, how did they notice it? Um, I mean, at some point, they noticed that some prefix was changing every minute and started looking and found that there were lots of them changing every minute. Um, and the one minute thing is interesting, right? Because that actually is what might lead you to think that it's like a confed bug or something. Like yeah, this. yeah. So I ended up, um, I remember I, I took like a whole bunch of debug output show command output and uh this was like on a friday when this thing 
came in. So I printed it all out and I was going to the beach. So I took it to the beach that weekend with me and was looking at it. That sounds riveting. Yeah. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was an exciting beach trip. And uh, I remember I, so I was thinking, it's like, why did I print this stuff out? And uh, it was because Cisco didn't give laptops yet back then. So this was like before <laughs> laptops were so even So you printed. probably saw the Sun workstation sitting on your desk. Yeah, right? I did. I did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. So, uh, so yes, me, me at the beach with my BGP update logs. Um, and eventually I like started scribbling out notes and had this diagram and all this stuff. And I was able to piece together like the flow of what was happening. Um, I didn't really fully understand yet, you know, why it was turning, but I could at least wrap my head around it a little bit. Uh, and the 60 second thing ended up being because of this, uh, process in iOS called BGP scanner. Uh, so scanner would basically wake up every 60 seconds and do a whole bunch of housekeeping work. Um, and one of the things that it did was it recomputed best path for all of the prefixes in the table. And at first glance, you would like, you kind of think about that. It's like, well, it, it shouldn't make, it shouldn't change anything. If you recompute best path, you should already be using what is the best path, you know, already. Um, so I started looking at that. I mean, it's like, we would recompute best path whenever we got a new update in, or if our current best path was withdrawn, we'd have to recompute best path. But the one scenario we didn't recompute best path was if like some random non best path went away, right? So like if I had 10 paths for a prefix and the fourth one is my best and the fifth one got withdrawn, well, who cares? It wasn't, it wasn't my best path. So I shouldn't, that shouldn't mean anything. Well, it turns out it does mean something and it can have an impact on which path is ultimately selected as the best. And that is what, that's where the whole 60 second thing trigger came in was scanner would run, it would recompute best path. It would do the little, you know, uh, update dance or that we called it earlier, right? Like all this stuff would shift back and forth and it would turn for two seconds. And then it was, back in the, the previous state where it's sitting there and it has a path picked as the best. And the next time scanner runs, it's gonna you know, go, oh, that one's no longer the best um, because some other path was withdrawn. So that's the, the scanner piece of it. Um, I remember too, so you know, they had some Juniper boxes um, and I don't think Juniper Juniper didn't have a scanner the same way we did, or they didn't recompute uh, best path in it the same way that they, they did. They did. They actually recomputed when they got the withdrawal. So the little pocket of the network that had the Juniper boxes, according to the guy at Union, like they were just constantly turning, right? Because they didn't have the. Yeah, I was going to say. You know, we talked about BGP optimizations in the last time we talked, and one of the things we talked about was, or one of the things you talked about was taking scanner out. And if you take scanner out, it actually seems like it would make the turn a lot faster, a lot worse than it is with the scanner. Yeah. So at some, at some point we did go through, this was a few years later, and we we started ripping as much stuff out of scanner as we could just to improve scalability. Yeah. And this was one of them. Like we, we started doing best path calculation every time we got a withdrawal for something. So eventually, yeah, we would, if you had med turn, you would turn faster once we once we put that fix in. So, <clears throat> yeah. so why would um, losing a worse route cause me to rescan? Can you go over that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so that that took us a little while to to figure that out. Um, and in a nutshell, it's because of MED. So BGP has this attribute called MED, um, and it's a multi exit discriminator. Uh, and this is one of the few attributes that in the best path algorithm, you don't look at every single time. You only do this, compare the meds uh, step, if the two paths that you're looking at came from the same AS. Um, and the reason is med, meds sort of designed to be a reflection of like IGP cost. So yeah. if I have, you know, one session to unit, one to sprint, and they run different IGPs, then their meds are gonna mean completely different things. So I wouldn't wanna compare yeah. them. It's basically a hint to the peering AES where I would like the peering AES to enter my AES. If I have five different peering points with you, where would I ask you please nicely to, to send traffic to me for this particular 
You know, I may ignore yeah. you by using local prep or whatever I want to, but it's kind of like, please, could you send this traffic for this particular destination through this entrance point in my network? And the reason you might want to do that is because my IGP cost is lower to get out of the network or whatever the case might be. So, yeah, it's, it's just, it's designed to influence inbound traffic. Like if you're, right. if you're dual home to the same service provider. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, I think when they, they didn't think about, you know, the, the implications of having this one step in the decision algorithm that's sometimes evaluated and sometimes not. Right. But that, that ultimately is like what causes the, the churn. Um, and you have to have like, uh, you've got to have a bunch of, different things in place in order for it to happen. Um, but, but that's the, 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 the real, you know, root cause for what, what makes it do it. Um, so, so it's basically a bi-stable condition in a routing protocol in, in BGP where the metric is not atomic, right? In other words, if you don't get the same result every time you run best path. Every time you run best path, it could be a different result. So even if you lose a non best path path, um, out of your table, then you're going to run best path, and every time you run it, you could get a different result. Type uh, of a thing. No, well, so now this, so then we're into deterministic med, right? So this, uh, this is another right. Uh, thing, right? But so yeah, that's another. So the the ordering of the paths does have an impact if med is being used. Um, so the workaround for that is this thing called deterministic med, where you basically sort the paths based on neighboring AS. And then right. for each neighboring AS, you pick the best one. And then of all those winners, you compare them. So in, in the end, it, it, it is deterministic. Um, iOS had a knob. You had to configure BGP deterministic med. I don't remember. Juniper, Juniper may have done it by default at yeah, that point. I, I, I don't know. Default, but, yeah. um, but these days, you, you know, like uh, FR, it's on by default. So um, it's just sort of up to the implementation. Um, so sorry, continue with your story. We're just, we're so where started. were we? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I was I was at the beach being a geek, looking at uh, debug output and whatnot. Um, so anyway, I came home um, and like right around this time, I, I left this ISP expert team and went to work on this uh, other team for Alvaro Rotana, who's a you know big big name in BGP, and um, he had this routing protocols deployment and scalability team. So so I shifted and was working with him and. Uh, myself and Alvaro and one of the other guys on the team named uh, Dave Cook all started looking at this. And um, we figured out that the, the that MED was, you know, the, the culprit. Um, and we figured out that, okay, we need to be able to send, um, you know, more than, than just the best path in order to, to resolve this. Um, I'll talk about that more in a minute. But we knew that it's like, okay, well, BGP can't send more than just the best path because if, if I advertise a prefix to a neighbor and then two seconds later, I advertise a, another path for that same prefix, well, the, the most recent one basically just overrides the, the previous one. It just does a, an implicit withdrawal. Um, so we came to the conclusion, it's like, okay, we need a way to send an additional path besides the best path. And so that was sort of the beginnings of add path. Um, and pretty soon right after this, uh, John Scudder started working on this with us too. He was at, he was at Cisco back then. Um, so the three of us, you know, started sort of put our heads together and, uh, or four of us, um, and started coming up with, you know, what is today ad path. Now they went through lots of different iterations, but that, that was sort of the beginning of it was it was a way to fix med churn was it's only, you know, initial goal was, that's what we wanted to do. Uh, so what else? So this was, okay, I'm going to cheat and look at my my notes here because I typed up a lot of notes. Um, <laughs> You're not supposed it's to not say cheating. that in all the show. Yeah. <laughs> it's preparation. It's, it's a preparation. It's I not like cheating. That. I'm going to look at my, my, uh, my work from beforehand. So anyway, so uh, <laughs> I, um, so we were working on this. Uh, and Alvaro comes to me, he says, uh, I want you to prepare a talk for Nanog on this. And uh, I was like, whoa, okay. So, so I put together some slides and, and went to Nanog. Um, that was a little nerve wracking. I was, I was like 
basically I had been out of school about two years. So I was pretty young at this point, went to Nanog and gave a talk on this thing. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and it was, you know, well received at Nanog. Uh, and that got a lot of people's attention and they went home and went, Oh yeah, our, our network is churning too. Um, so it ended up, ended up being pretty prevalent. Um, other things, we, we also figured out that there were sort of two different variations of, of the churn, right? So we, uh, we ended up calling them type one churn and type two churn. Uh, so type one churn was what you would hit if you had uh, basically a single tier of route reflectors uh, or a single tier of confederation, you know, sub ASs. Um, so the route reflector scenario, most, most folks that were using route reflectors only had one tier of route reflectors. And we eventually figured out that we could stop the churn in their networks by tweaking some IGP metrics. So you had like a cluster over here and a cluster over here. If you made the IGP metric between the two clusters really, really high, then that was enough to suppress the, the med churn. Uh, so for most folks, they were able to go and just tweak their IGPs and the churn stopped. And this is because probably, I would guess, because the route reflector was reflecting only a single path. So yeah. there was actually like this internal thing going on where route reflector one would choose the best path here and route reflector two would choose a different one and then they would reverse, right, yep. back and forth because, you know, they would each see the other's path change and then run best path. And then they would be like, oh, now there's another best path. I need to recalculate myself. And it would run best path and it would choose the other one because there was a different path available. So. Yeah, the fact that, um, so, so yeah, if, if you had all of your speakers in a full mesh, you would never hit churn, right? It was only if you right. used route reflectors or confeds, which they end up hiding some information, right? Because they, they also only pick one best path. You know, the route reflector right. can only yeah. advertise one path for each prefix. Um, so yeah, that's definitely, you know, that was, that was one of the requirements was you had to have, you know, route reflectors or, or confeds. Um, but yeah, like all the, all the guys or the, the ISPs that use single tier, they ended up being okay short term because once, once we figured this out, we were just like, okay, your, it was your inter cluster, sorry, your, yeah, the, the, the inter-cluster IGP cost had to be greater than the intra-cluster IGP cost. So basically just find the links between the clusters and, you know, set the cost to be really high. Um, and that was, that was enough to, to stop it. Um, UUNet though was kind of hosed because their model was they had like um, sort of like around the edge of the network, they had all these pops that had their own confederation sub AS number and then they had one sort of sub AS number in the middle. So they had multiple tiers of sub ASs. Right. And this hierarchical. Was, what we yeah. would call hierarchical today, yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So this was your this was the the type two turn. Um, and this one you you could try to tweak the IGP metrics, but it wouldn't stop the turn. Um, so we looked at it for a while and I was going back through my notes. I didn't realize it had been quite this long. So we, so we found, you know, this was like late 2000 when we found the initial turn or sometime in 2000, we found the initial turn. Um, and then we published the route oscillation draft in December of 2000. And this is where we like in detail went through what the type one and type two turns were. Um, and that's a that's a riveting read if you can't sleep at night you know, if you want to go read this <laughs> RFC. Um, so it's 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 RFC thirty three forty five is a, it's a, it's just an informational RFC that basically describes the the problem. Um, but so that was that was December. So it basically took us most of we spent like several you know several months sort of getting our heads wrapped around this and figuring out what at a low level was causing it and how to fix it and whatnot. Uh, because it wasn't until I looked, it was like the following May is when we first published uh, the ad path draft. Um, so we, we had figured out that for the type two churn, if you could find a way to advertise the best path from each autonomous system, that that would be enough to suppress the, the, the type two churn. Um, 
So basically, again, if you're peered with four different ASs in multiple different places, you just you pick the best path from each of those four ASs, and you have to, to propagate it everywhere. Uh, and if you do that, that will fix it. Um, but that couldn't be done because there was no ad path. So we started started down the road of, of doing ad path. Um, and meanwhile, during this whole time, you know, was still churning. Like they, I, I, honestly, I never, I know, I don't know when they finally weren't churning. I mean, they they turned on this thing for for years. Um, they were probably the, turning when they merged with whoever they merged with, or whatever <laughs> it was, most yeah. likely, because I don't think it was fixed before. They could yeah. still be churning. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so we we we. We sort of had a, an idea for how to, to fix this. Um, you know, we just needed to make a change to, to, to BGP to do it. Um, so we, we came up with the ad path draft and more or less the way it works is uh, ad path is just uh, allows you to attach an ID number to each prefix. So if I've got, you know, 10.1.1.1 slash 32, I can prepin this little prefix to it that makes that makes it so that I can advertise multiple paths for 10.1.1.32. slash So like the first path would be ID number one and the second one would be ID number two and so on and so on. So it gives me a way to, to send them without the second path implicitly withdrawing the, the first path because now they have this unique ID number attached to the prefix. Um, so that in a nutshell is, is like how ad path works. And so, so I know you put in your notes here that you were kind of surprised that it took a year to come up with this solution. As I recall, because I was on DNA at that time while you were on RP deployment, on a, I was on deployment architecture team working for Alvaro as well. And as I recall, Inca had some pretty serious objections to this and Scudder that, uh, you know, how much memory this was going to take and et cetera. And I know Srihari was working on it and others. And basically what it came down to was we didn't, nobody wanted to publish this because it would fix it, but it would be yeah. very difficult to implement. And so yeah. nobody wanted to publish the draft because it was basically unimplementable in iOS as it sat at that time. Yeah. And that, <laughs> that was a big issue. Like even, even like once we published it. Um, so we published this in 2002 and we couldn't implement it because it added BGP had to track keep so much more state. Uh, you basically had to remember, you know, which paths you advertise to each neighbor, not not just which prefix. Um, yeah. And had to remember what was the ID that you sent to to the neighbor for the various paths, so that you could later send a withdrawal. Um, and like at the time, and we talked about this on the last episode, right? So early two thousands, we had all of these old seventy five hundreds that were still deployed. Um, that had, you know, 128 megs of memory. So if we had implemented this, we would have, you know, as soon as those boxes upgraded, they would have, you know, run out of memory and fallen over and died. Um, so yeah, we had this great idea, like wrote up a solution, published it to the IETF, uh, and it basically kind of took five years, I believe, before anyone ever implemented it. Um, so iOS, uh, implemented in 2007. Um, I was not the one that implemented this, this. This part to me is weird. Like I worked on this, uh, this problem and came up with AdPath before I was ever in iOS development. I went and wrote BGP code for five years and then left and still hadn't like no one had still developed this thing. So it was, it was like <laughs> after I got out of iOS BGP that it was that before it was ever implemented. Um, and I think I believe Nikos is the one that, that implemented. Yeah, Nika, one Nikos of, is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nikos is. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. It starts with a T. Yes, yes, Nikos. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like Tony P. Don't ask him how to pronounce his name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it took it. It took a long time uh, before you know it got implemented. Um, so one other thing, I just I just remembered this. Uh, was like when we when we did the original oscillation draft, and I went to I remember this it was in St. Paul, Minnesota, in like January, uh, because that was that was fun. Uh, <laughs> ITF would they would have them there because the I guess the hotels were cheap because it was January in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> but I went and I so it presented this 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 churn thing, and it's like oh well these are the two types of churn that we know about. 
And um, I think it was Inca that stood up and he's like, he said, I've seen this before. And he goes, there's this thing in iOS where best path will prefer the oldest external path, right? Like it gets down near the end. And if you're basically left with two external paths, it just prefers the oldest one. And it turns out that solved a type of med churn. So there's actually a third type of med churn that's not in the RFC. And it's this, this one that was, you know, found, I don't know, I guess in the mid nineties or whatever it was when, when Inca put this, this fix in, um, so that's like another variation of, of med churn that, you know, was out there. But that one, that was kind of cool. Like I, I you know, got this in front of enough people mm -hmm. that someone's like, oh, I've seen something like this before. So that was, that was kind of neat. Um, but anyway, so we, we get the draft published, the ad path draft published uh, over the course of about five years, you know, Moore's law finally does its thing enough times that we can actually, you know, people can, can start implementing this thing and deploying it. Um, so it starts getting deployed and starts getting some more traction and visibility. Uh, and then this weird thing happened where now that this is getting out there and it's actually getting used, uh, people started submitting competing drafts to AdPath. Um, so we had this happen two different times. Uh, and both times it sort of prolonged the whole, you know, I guess your, your draft RFC process, right? Because you get, you get a competing still, draft in. Isn't there still um, a next best path draft or RFC out there? I'm trying to remember. I remember seeing the draft come out. I don't remember if it was ever implemented, but it was primarily designed to, to for ECMP and stuff or um, optimal route reflection rather than for the ad pass churn problem. Because I know optimal route reflection is still an issue, you know, so with a lot of route reflector. I don't know if there's, I haven't seen it. There might be a draft and I just, I haven't seen it. Um, yeah. It's very possible. Um, but the the scenario of, you know, I have a route reflector and I want to reflect more than just the best paths. I mean, that's kind of like a feature that you can do with AdPath, right? So it doesn't, yeah. once you've done AdPath, right. you don't need another protocol change on top of it. to Right. That was always that. the argument. AdPath yeah. solves that plus everything else. Yeah. And then the counter argument was, but AdPath is really hard to implement. So we'd rather do this because it's simpler to implement, but it doesn't solve all the problems. So you always end up going back to ad paths anyway, because it solves all the problems. Yeah. It's like any, anything where you need more than just the best path, right? You can, it's, yeah. it's, it's a feature that rides, you know, on top of this. Um, yeah. So like, yeah, the route reflector ones a, a common one just for, for like BGP pick the, like just the fast convergence stuff. You, you advertise a backup path basically so that you can converge faster. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the, yeah that was one of the big use cases for it like when once it did once it got implemented that was one of the first things that was first features that used it was was that sort of thing um, but but yeah so it's in, it was in ITF uh, competing drafts start coming in so each time that happened you sort of have this big process of like well now you have the community has to decide which one is the preferred draft to, to solve this problem. Um, so each, each time that happened, that added like two or three years, it, it seemed like to the, to the process. Um, so we eventually did, you know, ad bath kind of prevailed over both of those competing drafts that came in. Um, I went back and looked. So from, so from 2002 to 2008, there were seven different revisions. And at that point it, it hadn't even been accepted as a working group document yet. So it was, you know, draft Walton PGP ad path. And then from 08 and until 2016, uh, at that point, it was a working group document. So it's just draft ad paths. Uh, and there were 15 revisions in that time, time frame. And then eventually, uh, almost a year ago today, I got or last, last July, it finally became uh, an RFC. So a very, very long road. Uh, I, I asked John Scudder, I was like, you know, does, is this the record? Has anything gone longer than, than this to become an RFC? He's like, no, no, I mean, as far as, as far as he knew. So the unofficial record holder for longest ITF yeah, process, it's four, I guess. 14 <laughs> years as an, as an RFC draft. What most of the time happens at that, at some point is people just give up and stop updating the draft and it just goes expired and yeah, nothing well, happens with it. So 
We had we had a couple of stretches that I was looking like we went, you know, two two or three years between revisions one time between the 02 and 07. Yeah. There was a big stretch in there where not much happened with it just because no one had yeah. implemented it yet. Um, but then, you know, I guess between like 07 and 010, basically pretty much everybody implemented it in that time frame because there was enough enough memory out there. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it it eventually became, you know, eventually made it all the way to, to RFC status. Um, it just took a really long time. <laughs> Are there any um, maybe unconventional problems that Abpath has been used to solve um, besides churn? Have it, has anybody taken the protocol and used it to solve problems aside from that? Yeah, so there's, um, so there's like the, the, faster convergence scenario like that with route reflectors. So that's, that's one case that we I've, I've seen used. Um, another one was like, I guess about three years ago, uh, Netflix came up with a use case for it and they, they went to Nanog and did a presentation. Uh, and I forget all the details, but they were, they were using, you know, this in their data center to, to propagate multiple paths well, to, to fix something. It's really crucial if you're running IBGP in a spine and leaf, like LinkedIn does, uh, between T1 and T0, between top of rack and the, and the first spine, we use IBGP. Um, and in that case, you have to enable ad paths to get ECMP because you're four-way ECMP in the LinkedIn data center. But many data centers are 256-way or not to be like 16, I say 256, that's crazy, no. But like eight or 16-way ECMP, right? And even in T0 or T1 from top of rack of the first spine. And they often use IBGP in that situation. So you've got to use AdPath to get all those paths down there. Yeah. The other interesting, the other interesting one is always the the route reflector chooses the best path based on its IGP metric, which may not actually be the best path for a, any particular edge. So there's all these proposals around using AdPath to make sure that the EBGP speakers at the edge of the network actually choose the best path based on their local IGP metric rather than based on the route reflectors IGP metric. And I think that's fairly common as well yeah. from what I've seen in the past. Yeah, you can have, um, and this gets down to like just implementation details, like how, how the different vendors did it. So like uh, an FRR, you can have the route reflector, just you can say transmit everything via ad path, right? So then your clients, they basically just have all the different paths and they can they can choose based on their own IGP metrics. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a big one. Another one I've seen uh, one of our customers uses it. They have like uh, some AnyCast IPs that they use for I forget what it is, a load balancer or something another, and they use AdPath so that they, they advertise all different paths to that AnyCast IP address. Um, so that's an, another another use case. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, because because in most large scale data centers, you're actually get moving towards using any cast to do load balancing rather than appliance based load balancing. So, ad paths would be really helpful in that situation, not only for optimal pathing but also for fast failover because you don't want the any cast address to disappear, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be a really important use case as well. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, the Netflix guys. I tried to uh, I tried to negotiate like a free lifetime membership out of them since they were using that, <laughs> but they wouldn't they wouldn't buy it. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. it was worth a shot. Network operators have maybe no they'll sense of maybe humor. they'll see this and and, re and reconsider. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. But um, what else? I think that's so, see, so you had something there about TSAT. I actually worked on the TSAT program a little bit. And, uh, you know, it was a fairly interesting program actually launching. At the time, we were talking about a GSR or some type of blade running XR for a bit, I think. Yes. Um, into space on a satellite. And it, I don't think it ever really happened, but it was a pretty interesting project. Yeah, TSAT was this uh, Air Force project to put basically a router on a satellite. Um, and they were they were doing this with Boeing. Um, and I ended up, I got involved with this because uh, basically at some point I got tired of writing code and got, got, sort of got out of it and went and worked on this TSAT thing for a few That's years. That's weird, Daniel. That's I know. Weird. I know. That's crazy talk. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just pushed like, I just pushed like three commits from Daniel today in a free range routing. It's crazy talk <laughs> that you were tired of doing code. I don't know. I, I, I took a nice six year break from uh, from writing code, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I, I needed the break at that point. But uh, but yeah, these guys like um, I remember 
they were, I forget why, but one of their engineers was really hung up on AdPath. And he's like, we need, we need AdPath. And this was in 07. So Nikos was probably in the middle of working on it, but hadn't, hadn't committed it yet. And uh, I remember I kept going back and forth with, with this engineer and like, eventually he's like, we need the Walton draft. We need the Walton draft. And finally I was like, I'm the Walton in the Walton draft. I was like, you don't need <laughs> the Walton draft. And so at that point he, uh, I find that, but, but until that he would like, I, he would not listen. <laughs> Uh, you know, that doesn't always work for me, Daniel. Uh, we tried that with Donald's license and folks <laughs> well, in OSPF, right? Well, you can't a, claim whole... you're the Walton. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I can't claim I'm the Walton. But yeah, you know, you, I've had that happen too, where somebody said, I really need this. And somebody loops me into the conversation. And they're like, well, let's let's get the person who wrote the RFC involved. And I said, hey, you don't need that. And they're like, no, we need it anyway. And you're like, dude. You're like, no, no, <laughs> no, <not really. laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, so, he sat there. It eventually, uh, I read that that was kind of weird. The Congress cut funding for it or whatever. So we we were watching like you know the congressional budget hearing, and that's how I learned that my project was canceled. That that was kind of the first. <laughs> so it's like but that's way, sad. Daniel, yeah, yeah, it is really it is. But by the way, that is still there. Are there is still a company that's commercializing? But instead of launching the router, they're putting the router in the in the base station like at the bottom. And of course, the whole point of TSAT was is that you wanted the router in the sky because of all the delay going up and down, right? Yeah. And so you didn't want to actually carry a layer two switch across death to layer two, I'll just say it. You didn't want to carry a layer two switch across the, uh, you know, you wanted to get the layer three switch into the satellite so that you could, you wouldn't be double, uh, you wouldn't be trombone routing, right? Across the yeah. satellite. So, I mean, what are your what are your app guys going to do with that kind of latency? I mean, we talk about latency from the east coast <laughs> to the west coast. That's like latency to the moon and back. That's pretty significant. Yeah, it was. Uh, so, so after it got canceled, um, Cisco did like a, a commercial sort of sister project. Uh, what was it called? Um, anyway. They, they, yeah, they well, that a, actually spun off, and there's a small company that still works. Yeah, on it. but that right. actually launched. Like they, they, they put. Yeah. I worked on that. That was iOS on a little radiation hardened board, and was launched. It was a, as far as we knew, it was the first BGP speaker in space. Um, and yeah, <laughs> the, the latency, the latency on that was was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was interesting. And did you run how many on that one so you could figure out how many peers that little board could handle and uh, <laughs> how many routes? <laughs> we should have. I think it had a few dozen or so. It, it, it wasn't very many. But, cool. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Russ, I, I wore your, your favorite T-shirt for today. Just... <laughs> <laughs> what it should say is run away from. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> We love BGP. <laughs> no, no BGP is great. We just have to stop using it to throw everything in. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so deployed though. It makes it it's sort of has so much momentum, right? That's that's why everything keeps getting added to it. Um, yeah, until it crashes, <laughs> and then we'll stop adding stuff. <laughs> But yeah. All right, we we digress. <laughs> no. Are there are there any other questions about ad path or turn for Daniel? Any other thoughts? No. No. We've we've we've, we've exhausted we we've exhausted the topic. I think that means it's time to wrap it up. So, so we Elaine, you thank need to put crickets in there. <laughs> you need to put the sound of crickets in there after you ask that question. Oh, okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. All right. All right. Well, that is it for another history networking video podcast recording. Um, we want to thank Daniel for joining us. Um, we'll put some of those links in the show notes to uh, to his Nanog talk and uh, to the RFC. And you can uh, read um, as, uh, as bedtime reading if you're having trouble going to sleep. I'm sure that that would be appreciated. So thanks for joining us. And we'll be back soon with another episode of History of Networking. Mm-hmm.